second. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. As a start, I should like to thank our esteemed front row, including the organizers and the chairman, to hopefully tell me five minutes before the end of my talk that I'm slightly running out of time. Um, today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about something that um, Igor thankfully called a hard problem, namely the Anderson transition in um, a fully intacting system in three dimensions. And our first host, when he came up and introduced the conference, he said um, something that we sort of, I think if I paraphrase him correctly, we should take it easy on the mathematicians with all the hard physics. So I decided not to include so many equations, but rather um, show you sort of more intuitive pictures. And we start by showing you a movie, namely a movie of a multifractal. And I have two movies. Uh, before we go through the movies, let's look at what I'm actually plotting here. I'm plotting here psi squared distribution in a three-dimensional cube right at the Anderson transition. I've plotted psi squared only if it is larger than the average of psi squared. So all the white spaces here don't mean that there's nothing. It just means that there the electron is less than on average. Then I've plotted um, cubes which get larger when psi squared get larger. So this is sort of the orange cube over here, which is the largest. And then I also changed the color such that low psi squared is uh, blue all the way to green, yellow all the way to red. So the more reddish it gets, the more larger the cubes will be, the larger psi squared is. So this is the distribution of um, a single electron in three-dimensional disordered systems. So all of you who probably had quantum mechanics at some stage in your career looked at the books. This is how um, the S-wave function looks like, not around hydrogen, but in a disordered system, right? Really different. Okay, now let's start with the movies. Let's start with a simple one. Namely, we're just flying through basically the same wave function. Slightly colors have slightly changed. What used to be orange is now this red blob over here. I made the cubes a little bit smaller. So otherwise, they would dominate. And we're just flying through and we're returning. Okay, I'm being let down by Microsoft. I click the button of repeat automatically, but it doesn't do that. Okay, um, let's do it again just for the fun of it. Can you see it? You can't see it. Okay, good. <laughs> let's go to the next. <laughs> so that's the same thing. Um, but now we're replicating it periodically. I've put some shade in the system so that you don't see the things which are further apart and just flying straight through the thing and you see the big red cube eventually flying sort of towards and then flying to the left and then it repeats, hopefully this one at least repeats. And um, can I ask the members of the audience what this reminds you of? Come on someone, don't be shy. Exactly, thank you very much. If I may say so, you're probably as old as I am. If I try that in front of the young, younger audience, they don't actually shout that. They shout something else. But um, exactly that's Star Trek. Why? Why does it remind you sort of of Star Trek a little bit? Is there there's a bit more behind that? Anyone has astronomy colleagues at home? There are papers out which say that the large-scale structure of the universe is indeed a multifactor. Um, at my university, it turns out that these papers are considered not so good. So that's a controversy in the, in the literature, really. So some people say large-scale structure is multifactor. Some say that's nonsense. Nevertheless, yeah, it reminds me of Stratec. Now that I've started asking the audience something else, anyone knows why I didn't have little spheres here, but just little cubes? Because the ray tracing on these six faces on that cube already takes three days on sort of my small computers that I have. If I would have to do it with spheres where the shades sort of shadows are all different, I would never be able to do that. This system is a million um, sites computed, so it's a 100 cube system. Something that these days for non interactive system you can compute on a regular PC in within five minutes. The ray tracing, however, still takes on the order of days to actually do that. Okay, good. So I think now you have an intuitive understanding for 
multifractals really are. Now let's get to the hard science, the problem that I want to resolve, as I said in the, in, in the title. And it's a long-standing problem. We've all spoken about the Anderson transition here now for three days. Um, we all say there is the Anderson transition, but then it turns out it's very complicated when you really want to study it. And if you look back what most talks were about, most talks were about what happens in one dimension, what happens in two dimension. And part of the reason is that it's an old and long-standing problem that people had and still have, even in experiments, if you want to characterize the Anderson transition. And some of the first attempts that were done were, of course, when the Anderson transition traditionally is most relevant, namely in semiconductors, the problem that Anderson really wanted to solve. And in the 1980s, they started doing experiments in sort of classical semiconductors, phosphor doped silicon, and many others. And they came, they saw a transition, and they did this in sort of the semiconductors by basically indirect measurements. They put a contact on one side of the semiconductor and a contact on the other side, passed the current through and measured what was the voltage, and then saw whether they were on the metallic or on the insulating side. And then they did some sort of finite size scaling at the transition, and they found what the critical exponents are. And as you see, if you just look at the experimental data, the experimental data is basically all over the place. It goes from about one half all the way to now 1.6. Maybe there's a slight trend if you look at it sort of in terms of time. That's the conductivity exponent. Yeah, it's really the conductivity exponent. That's normally what these people in the semiconductors measure, right? Keep in mind, that's why I said it's they do indirect measurements. They cannot look inside the semiconductor. These beautiful experiments that Eagle showed before, and some of them I'll show later on as well, is sort of recent when we can actually start looking inside these things. In the old traditional experiments, you can't. You can just put the contact there and, and then see what comes out. And that's sort of transport measurements. And so you see, we don't know what the exponent is, which is horrible, because we don't know then what the universality class is, and it's such a simple model, we should know that. Now, before we all get very sort of um, arrogant against the experiments, of course, they look, just, just look at what the numerics test, sort of, um, what people have tried to do over the years, and you see that in sort of the mid-1980s, when the first predictions numerically, based on sort of initial transfer matrix, came out, well, it was around 1, maybe to 1.3, maybe sort of somewhere down here. And then a couple of years later, it increased, and people thought, well, it's probably more like 1.3, which was sort of the flavor of the decade, until um, a pirate in 1995 appeared. That was Angus McKinnon, who had sort of the first result saying, no, no, he thinks it's 1.5. And then, um, well, I don't call them pirates, but sort of two... Samurai warriors appeared, who then in 99 said, no, if you do it really properly, you should actually get something which is 1.6. So theoretically, we're also having a problem, right? So that we don't quite know what it is. Now we think we have 1.6, but okay, that 1.6 is really different from what people find in the experiments. How can that be? This is all non-interactive numerics, yes. So... Sasha is alluding to one point that basically brings us all together and why we're still, I think, to some extent, talking about the Anderson transition with interactions, as we're doing here, because this fundamental problem is also not solved, and people are saying, okay, maybe it's because in real systems there are many body interactions. What could be the culprit? But then that original problem was largely forgotten, and then people moved on, tried to study generally what happens with many body interactions in disordered systems in 1D, 2D, and so on. Okay, now I'm going back to this old problem, and I'm going to present you something which I think, at least to my mind, explains what can possibly happen, or saying it differently, I'm going to show you that I can, in a fairly systematic way, reproduce all the set of exponents fairly consistently, and... Um, I think the answer you'll see is surprising. Uh, let's put it like that. Okay. Right. And this is the answer. So, what we have done is we've now studied 
atomistically correct density functional theories, the best what material science these days computationally can do, in linear scaling DFT. We've thrown this at the problem. I'm not quite telling you yet what the problem is. And then we studied wave functions and did multifractal analysis, just like Igor said it before, for the non-interacting problem, or for that problem, because we don't know how much interaction is in that problem. So we did multifactor analysis, did proper finite size scaling, did finite size scaling that is robust and stable in the sense in which Keith and Tommy are using it. And we did this then energy dependent across the impurity band. And here I'm just now trying to explain what you see. Here you see the energy axis. Zero is the Fermi energy. Everything above zero is where the conduction band is. The valence band is somewhere to the left. I'm not showing it he here. Then here you see the impurity band emerging as a function of concentration. So here I'm showing the concentration axis. And then in the inset, you see the critical exponents for exactly the same energies that we have down here. And you see the critical exponents for two types of multifractal exponents go from about 1, maybe all the way to 1.6, maybe to 1.3, and then when we get close to the Fermi level, they drop to these onomous numbers that people found before, namely one half. No, careful. Careful. <laughs> yes, I'm getting to that. Okay, so here these are the critical exponents. Now these points here are the... Um, is basically the mobility edge that we've computed. It's the critical concentration where the system changes from outside localized, down here, to inside extended. And of course, these numbers have been estimated in the infinite system after proper finite size scaling. But what I show you in these colors that Igor was now asking, I'm showing you um, a particular multifractal exponent, alpha naught, for the people who sort of know it, and that multifractal exponent should be about 3 in an extended system, and it should come very large in a very large system, should go to infinity, where in a finite system doesn't go to infinity. So the colors, just look at them, red means extended as we probably want to be. We have basically plane waves are as localized as we're likely going to be in that system. So what you see over here, below this critical concentration, we have localized states, also here as well. And above, we're moving into more and more extended states, while the conduction band is already, as a start, as it should be, fully extended. Okay. Um, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to use this symbol to indicate a metal, and this symbol, which is a piece of plastic, just to indicate an, an insulator. Okay. So, this is a variation of the critical exponent as you go and change the Fermi energy that you're looking at. Now, what have we done? I've said we've done it by using multifractal analysis. So here's a different plot, Igor. That's basically alpha 1 and alpha naught. And this is the result for one particular coarse graining. Where? You mean in the conduction band? Yeah, I have here. Well, there is a transition here, right? There is a transition here. No? It's a bit hard because you're not used to this. So I'll make contact to the way we normally look at Anderson and transition later to see how this, how this goes. Okay, what we've done is we've done the mel full melted fractal analysis. So what I'm showing you here, for example, it's just showing you for this alpha naught exponent from 3 to uh, 4.5, again as a function of the same energy, for um, this one system with a particular concentration of impurities. And here the colors now denote basically how much of uh, states we're basically having. And uh, you see here nicely the beginning of the conduction band, which has about 3 as its um, alpha naught, so it's extended states. 
And then, and then you see here is your impurity band. You have many states here. And many of those states have about 3.2, 3.4. And then you see a tail in the impurity band to more and more larger and hence localized um, states in the impurity band. You see that tail, localized states at the bottom of the impurity band, fairly extended niche states in the impurity band. And then you see that the top of the impurity band starts to interact a lot with the conduction band. And that, in many ways, is already sort of the theme of what is happening. Namely, it's at this end of the transition, where you are close to the Fermi energy, where normally you should be doing all your experiments, where you cannot just ignore the interaction of the impurity band with the conduction band. And that brings in a totally new effect that is normally forgotten in the Anderson model. The normal Anderson model is a single band Anderson model just for the impurity band. In this real system, there is a conduction band, and the conduction band dominates the physics right at the Fermi energy. And the conduction band serves as a source of fully extended states. The conduction band is extended. You're basically swamping the transition at the right that you were expecting with the conduction band states. It does this, right? That's what the outcome tells you. That's how it looks like. Okay, so let's start. Of course you can. Well, okay. So you're saying... What type of DFT have we used? Yeah, well, no, what we're, get, what we're going to get is we're going to see that um, this mobility edge is probably a factor three or four not quite right. And that leaves exactly, that's the problem. That's the accuracy of the DFT at that level. So that's where it enters, where the DFT you see is really an, an approximation. How do we know that we're not quite right? We don't know that we're not quite right, because the system that I'm going to look at for a reason I'm going to explain has not been well studied. Also experimentally, we have uh, one paper which basically tells us what NC should be close to the Fermi level. So we're three or four off by that. They find, I don't know, we find, if you look at this for example, 10 times 10 to the 20, I think they find... Um, 5 times 10 to the 20, or some such number. So, I should actually express it differently in the sense of saying that you may not like the DFT, but I'm going to, no, but I'm, but I'm going to tell you that I'm able to predict where the transition point is in an atomistically correct system within a factor of 3 or 4. And part of what I'm going to tell you here is basically in my mind, Anderson localization has now moved away from these toy models. You can now use it in real existing systems to find out quantitatively, relatively correct, where is the transition. And for many of the applications in these doped semiconductors, that's really what people want to know. Okay, normal Anderson model, you will recognize this state uh, right at criticality. This is a wave function in a sort of more extended metallic-like state. You see psi squared is nearly everywhere, but you have very few of those big boxes here. Whereas on the other hand, you're in the localized regime. Psi squared is localized in a certain regime, and you find actually that this big cube uh, makes up in the order of about 50% of the whole wave function. So this is highly localized. And one of the reasons why I sort of have to say that, and I hope it comes back later better, is um, in Anderson, in this model, you increase the disorder from weak disorder, and then you increase the disorder to go into the localized regime. In this doped semiconductors, you do exactly the opposite. The semiconductor host itself, silicon, is an insulator, and if you dope it with more and more dopants, you go this way. Right? So that's something that um, people who've done Anderson for a long time sort of have to think slightly backwards. When I now increase the concentration of my dopants, I actually lower the disorder in my system, so to speak. So keep that in mind as we go along. 
So another slide just to set the scene for what happens in normal Anderson um, transition in three dimensions. The normal phase diagram in the single system looks like this. So if I increase my disorder from zero going up like here, I have a bubble of extended states and that bubble eventually stops at the critical transition. I'm just localized outside. Now, quickly going back, um, remember, going up in this order meant coming down in concentration. So here I'm basically doing the same. This bubble of extended states that you saw before is in this here, and then eventually it stops, and I'm just left with outside localized states. You have to invert this. All right, we know that the transition, of course, we have a localization length which diverges with the critical exponent. Um, we can do multifactor analysis in the normal Anderson transition. We can, for example, study the distribution of these multifactor exponents alpha. We can look at the scaling of the distributions. We can look at the scaling of moments of the distributions, these Q moments that Igor talked about. And one moment is, for example, the average of the distribution, which is this alpha naught exponent. And you see as a function of system size, this alpha naught exponent in the metallic and the insulating regime looks differently. In the metallic regime, it tries to go towards 3 if you increase your system size. So the blue curve is the larger one. It goes from this value to this one, more towards 3, which is somewhere in here. Whereas on the insulating side, it tries to go towards infinity. And of course, the closer you are to the transition, the further you're also away from in a finite system from this infinity. And when you do that, you're getting um, the critical disorder strength, which in that system should be 16.52, roughly here, uh, the ones have dropped. And um, you also get the critical exponent. This is supposed to be new, but PowerPoint has a different opinion on that. And you see as a function of different uh, Q values, you get roughly the same critical exponent, which is this 1.59 or so. So that's sort of state of the art in the normal Anderson transition. And now we'll try to do the same in this other model. And um, in the interest of time, I'll just very briefly go through uh, maybe some of the experiments that people have done in Anderson localization recently, which are not semiconductors. And of course, the advantage in these not semiconductors experiments, you can actually see the wave function. You can look inside, right, in these sort of atomic gases. Maybe just as an example, here you have a Bose-Einstein condensate. There's no disorder. To let it go as a function of time, you see the Bose-Einstein condensate spreads. Whereas here, if you have strong disorder, you see the Bose-Einstein condensate just stays. It doesn't spread. It is localized where it was initially. And um, you recognize this also from Iga's talk. Here the idea is that, of course, Anderson localization is a wave interference phenomenon. So it happens not just in electronic systems. It happens basically in all wave systems, and here I have to be a little bit careful, I should say in all wave systems that can be described by a scalar wave equation because in light the situation is a bit more complicated. Okay, so this brings us back to the problem which we're now trying to solve. So what have we done? Well, when the problem first appeared, people immediately said it could be because of Coulomb interaction. What are the things that we've ignored thus far? Well, there could also be spin-orbit coupling in these systems, in the semiconductors. Maybe spin is important. People were saying also, that was a criticism actually experimentalist at the time, you really need to measure at close to t equals zero as possible. And when you try to do that, you have experimentally have problems. One of them is, for example, um, electron heating, uh, which means that your system overall, where you measure the temperature, may be at a low temperature, but whether your electrons in the system actually have that low temperature, that's not clear. So really experimental difficulties that you encounter when you do these experiments. There was the control of the concentration. How can you actually control the concentration that you put in your uh, semiconductor to really say you have 1%? Is it not 1.1%, 1.9%? How closely can you control this? And we all know when you, when you don't really control it, all the finite size scaling can screw up. And furthermore, there is sort of the idea that how do you control, how homogeneous do your donors actually look in the system. Because when you throw them in a system in a correlated fashion, you we know in correlated disorder, the critical exponent can also change. But all throughout the years, this is what the experimentalists have tried to achieve and tried to do better and better. For example, these experiments here, um, um, germanium and gallium, they were done in the neutron flux uh, reactor in which you put, or oh, which one is it? I think germanium, you put a germanium sample in the neutron flux, the neutron flux itself is very homogeneous, you'd pack one neutron out of the germanium, you're left with gallium, and then you have your 
um, gallium dope germanium system, right? Very homogeneously distributed. But still, you're not getting to the sort of 1.6 of the non-attacking one. So what is going on here? So the experimentalists did a lot of hard work, and still we are, we're left with this. Right, so now what are we doing, finally? We're doing not the Anderson model, but we're doing a fully atomistically realistic crystalline silicon with donor impurities. We take into account nine atomic orbitals. Normally in silicon and in the donor, you occupy to the 3p level. We take the 3d levels into account as well, also they're normally empty. So all the way from 1s to the, to the sort of 3d levels. We take that into account. We put it on the right letter structure. And we do interactions in the way DFT does interactions, which I would say is not very well understood even by the DFT people. You can think about it as sort of Hartree Fock plus. All the magic of DFT goes into, we'll see in a second, the so called energy functional. And the one that we're using is the best known in the literature for silicon. So silicon can be very well described by this. But what you do to the interactions by doing that is a bit not so clear. Okay, so how DFT works? We can compute ground state properties. So we're doing a many body interaction system, but we're not doing many body localization because we're just looking at ground state properties. And the idea is that it's uniquely determined by the electron density. And hence we reduce the many body problem basically to a system of non-interacting non electrons in an effective potential. This includes the Coulomb interaction via exchange and correlation, but the exchange correlation part is this functional where we don't know which one to use, and we, there is no exchange functional to use for, let's say, a Hubbard interacting term or something like that. Right? So we use the best that we know for silicon. And as uh, Ferdinand was saying, sort of, gets most things right, but band gaps and certain numerical numbers, it doesn't get quite right. Okay, and here's just uh, some examples of what people can do. Now, why haven't people done that before us? DFT has been around for many years. Why are we not all doing Anderson localization with DFT? Problem is, we can't get to the large system sizes even in DFT, really. So what you look at this, um, if you increase the number of atoms, you see, for example, at normal DFT, the thing that most material scientists use, VASP or CASTEP, that can go to the number of about a few hundred atoms. That's what you can do, and then you're sort of screwed. You can't do much more in the normal plane wave DFT. In the last 10 years, there's an exciting new development on so-called linear scaling DFT that scales linearly with the um, number of atoms that you have in your system, and they can reach no longer 2,500. That's about 10 years old. Nowadays, they can reach at the order of about 10,000. They're not applying this to things like doped semiconductors. They're really more interested in biological systems. Here you see some sort of protein structure so that they really want to study with these large systems. So about 10,000 is what we can do. No. <laughs> so this one tap is all the way phase coherent. It's meant to be, right? They have one year orbitals, they do everything phase coherent. Um, there are two ways in which you could now look at this. You could say, okay, I've taken the best what DFT has to offer these days, let's see what it can do, right? Um, the other thing that you, you can say is, I've even taken the, the lead developer of the linear scaling DFT, who's the co-author, Nick Hain, on this. So we really have the best that DFT can do. But then if you also look at what we've done in terms of multifactor analysis, the wave functions look as good, the, the multifactor stuff looks as Linear, if you did double log plot, if you do, do tau of q as a function of q as all the rest, there isn't anything that I can see which in that sense is tricky. There's a technical problem that's, that is tricky, which we have sort of ignored. 
I would be surprised if that cooks up in the end and sort of does something horrible. But besides that technical problem, I think let's just carry on. Let's see how far it can take us. Okay, so just to remind you that um, the Anderson wave function we looked at before has not 10,000 atoms, but you can go up to the order of many million of atoms in this thing. So again, we're, that's what we're competing at. And later on, you'll see fluctuations in, the, in the sort of some of the accuracy that we're having, and that gets you back to basically saying in terms of numeric system sizes we can reach, we are where we used to be for the non-interacting system 20 years ago, roughly. So we're, that's, that's an issue. All right, so really we wanted to study phosphor-doped silicon, and then you look at the concentration, and you see even if you take an 8,000 um, atom system, then the lowest you can take with one impurity, you're already in the metallic regime. So with an 8,000 system, you never cross where sort of the transition is expected to be. Even if you go to 32,000, you only have two situations when you're actually to the left of the transition in the insulating regime. We cannot do phosphor-doped silicon even with this large linear scaling DFT, okay? You can look at sort of back of the envelope calculations. We know roughly where the transition is in phosphor doped silicon. So let's go to the next system in the sulfur doped um, silicon. And here, sort of the two papers that looked at this before, this is roughly the range where they find the transition, 1.8 to 4.3 times 10 to the 20. And here, when we want to put in 20 impurities, we need only about 2,000 to 5,000 atoms. So the same plot now done with sulfur doped silicon shows you that we can nicely cut across where people expect the transition to be roughly. We have enough states on the insulating and the conducting side, hence we take sulfur doped silicon. Not the most exciting choice, but okay. It solves another problem as well, however. Um, I said before that in phosphor doped silicon, people were saying that maybe the phosphor atoms talk to each other, they correlate. The way you implement sulfur in the silicon matrix is by basically um, ion implementation. You shoot these guys in and basically where they are, they melt the system briefly and then they get stuck. So these guys are not correlated whatsoever. They really sit at random positions. So it's even a bit of an advantage that we can take sulfur doped silicon. Right. Now, let's try to be smart. So what we're doing is we are not going all the way with DFT. We're doing DFT up to about 4,000 atoms. We make a prototype catalog of what happens if we have one silicon, uh, one sulfur donor, donor in the silicon matrix, if we have two sulfur donors in different positions in the silicon matrix. And from that prototype, we build up an effective tight binding model, which just allows us to go much larger. So in the interest of time, I'll skip that a little bit. Just here as a check, for example, we have to figure out how many um, shells do we have to go out when we put in an impurity such that all the other atoms are no longer affected. Yeah, if you put a donor impurity here, if you put a donor impurity, it affects the hopping to the next neighbor even to the second neighbor, third neighbor, fourth neighbor, only when you're at the fifth neighbor, basically the change is about one. Don't need to do that anymore. That depends. That happens just for one donor. And then you need to do... And now if you need to put two next to each other, you see how does that affect the system. So you make a catalog of um, donors next to each other, two apart, three apart, four apart, five apart, in the full diamond lattice in, in which um, silicon lives. And from that catalog, then you can start larger tight binding models where you take into account up to the fifth nearest neighbor the change. Exactly so, because we still cannot compute a 10,000 atoms sulfur doped silicon system because that takes at the order of a month to run for every configuration and we want to disorder sample afterwards. We can't do that. Should I at some stage no I have said it here. Right? So we make this this catalog and then we take this catalog, we place it in our sort of system and I'm not drawing fully cubic here. I'm just drawing simple cubic, sort of not diamond cubic, simple cubic. Let's say we put the the impurities here. There's no impurity out here. Here we put two as a neighbor, let's say random, so we put catalog elements on-site potential tight bindings, up to fifth shells, 
for this double system, and then if you have for some chance, and for the concentrations that we use, it happens very rarely, three which are relatively close, then we sort of um, take the, the elements that we have from the two relatively close um, catalog. So there's a bit of an ap approximation when you take three s sulfurs very close, we treat it as if they were a pair of two sulfurs very close. And then we construct the matrices and diagonalize this. So, and then we do normal finite size scaling, as we've done previously in the Anderson model. And finally, these are the results that we're getting. So first of all, we build the impurity band. So now I'm increasing my concentration uh, of impurities. Very few concentration here, very few donors. And then I put more and more in, and I see I get the impurity band, which is actually building. To the left, I have the valence band. To the right, I have my conduction band. Right, and in the normal Anderson model, um, this was when here I'm building my impurity band, it would be coming this way, basically. In the normal Anderson model, the band is sort of everywhere. So again, it's a bit different. You have to build it first by putting states in. And then what we see as a um, comparison between these catalogs that we built and the tight binding model, then you see that um, the red line is actually the effective model and the dashed line is just for the same system computed, um, the um, DFT calculation. You see to the left, we have good agreement between basically the states here, and we don't compute lots of states in the valence band, so really you should think about the valence band starting up here and then going, you know, going very strong in the density of states. We just compute the onset. Here you have your full impurity, and here again in the conduction band, we only compute one or sort of actually five states, and then if you were to compute more, you would see the full conduction band emerging there. Conduction band. CB conduction band, VB valence band, EB impurity band. So finally, let's look at some states that we're getting. So just to show you, this is the first set of states computed in an atomistically correct system, sulfur-doped silicon. Um, up here, the crosses denote where the impurities are sitting. And here I'm plotting with little spheres now which have the same color from blue to red, where the psi squared is. I'm in an insulator, I increase my concentration, and you see there are more black crosses here, and then I'm basically in the, in the metal over here. And I can do, of course, the same thing. I, instead of changing the concentration, I just change the energy where I am. Uh, so I have the same concentration here. The orange dots denote where the impurities are. It's the same set of orange dots over here. And then this cloud denotes where my wave function psi squared is. Here it is highly localized, here it is highly extended. In fact, there's a bit of a correlation. If you look at it, the clouds do have a little bit of a preference to sit close to where my impurity donors actually are. Okay, so now we look at the density of states. We see with low donors, we get an impurity band, which then slowly grows and very quickly merges with the conduction band. And then if you go it even further, you sort of see tails over here. And um, this bluish, well, it's not really blue, but violet or something, um, shading here denotes actually where the mobility edges that I showed you before would distinguish between localized states and um, extended states in here. And again, localized states over here. So we start initially everything localized. And then we have sort of localized states here, the conduction man fully extended extended states in here, and then again localized states here. So I think that was sort of the transition that you wanted to see, right? It's exactly, it's exactly that one. So we do multifactorial scaling now, finite size scaling that we see in order to come up with where the mobility edge is, where the critical exponents are. I don't really want to tell you about the detail, just to show you how some of the scaling curves look like in the end. So this is a scaling curve just to convince you that we actually have some sort of crossing. It's not a very good one because this one is averaged over the whole band. And I've showed you before, actually, I should do it energy, de energy resolved. Okay, so I have a crossing point here, so I can find where's the, criti where's the critical uh, concentration. Oh. Okay, and just to show you how bad the data is compared to what the best is that you can do sort of in the Anderson model. That clearly looks much better than sort of this flow of stuff that you have over here. Nevertheless, you can still do proper finite size scaling with this. Um, if you do finite size scale, again, this is the result that we get at one of those transition points 
in that new model, we see that we have a, a scaling curve. There is sort of a particular value where we have the metal insulator transition. And again, this is for comparison with the much superior accuracy that you have in the Anderson model. Nevertheless, you can do the finite size scaling. And you can extract things like where the transition is and where that particular energy that was the here, what the critical exponent is. We do it for different values of energy in the band. Exactly. So that's what comes out. You see, we do it for different values of energy in the band. The critical exponent, now I've shown it for different coarse grainings, which is a technical thing you don't need to worry. I've shown it um, for different Q moments, zero and one. Ideally, of course, this should all agree. Right? In the perfectly large system, we've done enough samples, this should all agree. However, the system sizes, the 10,000 that we do, and we average 1,000 times over this, corresponds basically um, to 21 cubed or something. So those people as old as me remember that's what we did in the mid-1990s, end-1990s. That's where we are in system sizes that we can reach. And for that, it's actually pretty good. So all these values with error bars were estimated using proper p-value analysis, and the p-values are in the acceptable range. So what you see, you see this spread around 1 to maybe 1.6, but then always dropping to about 1.5 if you're getting close to the Fermi energy. The top is the exponent here. That's the new exponent, yeah. It's new obtained in different ways, which should all be the same. Now done in different energy windows as you, as you go below the Fermi energy. And similarly here, sort of the, um, the transition point, the NC value that you're having. Okay, so let's look back at this picture again. Yep. We sit at a fixed energy interval. We take all the states in, in this energy interval. Look at all the alpha naught values that we have. Right? And then do it for different system sizes. And then we get finite size scaling for different system sizes, collapse it on finite size scaling curve, do the normal thing. <laughs> this is this well, yeah. This is the one that happens at that energy window half the distance between the neighbors. Right? Averaging over all those alpha nodes that you have in there, that's the concentration that you get, this mobility edge. Well, the conventional transition is what, you cl what people claim that they are sitting at this point. Right? That's exactly what they claim that they are sitting at that point. That is, of course, exactly the problem. How do you know that you're sitting at that point? How do you know experimentally that you're sitting at that point? This change here corresponds to a change in concentration at the order of 1 to maybe 5%. Donors, dopants. That corresponds to a change in concentration of dopants at the order of so between 5 to 1%. So what I'm saying is you want to be at this point. But if you cannot control your concentration very well, or you have compensation in your semiconductor, which means you have other, this is a negatively doped semiconductor, if you have other positively doped impurities in your system that you can't control, you don't really know where you are. You, don't, you can't control that. Right? And in fact, there are studies by our colleague Ito, who does exactly this, who intentionally compensates. And when he compensates, he finds that um, if he is in an, oh, how do I get it right? Um, when, well, when he compensates, I think the answer is that he finds numbers which are about 1. And when he is in the uncompensated one, he finds that he gets numbers which are about 1.5. So the way why I wanted to look at this thing again, so now let's We've done all this, we know what we've done, right? It's clear what we've done. 
And now let's, let's look at this. So I hope I've convinced you that you believe that the mobility edges are correct. We did multi-factor analysis, did all this. And then for each of these energies, we computed the kill exponents. We can do that. I mean, yes, there's large fluctuations in all this, but nevertheless, there's a difference between 1 and 0 0.5 over here. Now let's look at this system. Let's look at this thing here. So why is it 1.5 in this system? Look what happens when the gap between the impurity band and the conduction band eventually closes. You see that the conduction band basically provides a sea of extended states. These extended states have a multifactor exponent or correlate, which is about infinity, or a localization length, which is also infinity. These are purely extended states, and these guys now dominate the physics in this impurity state close to the Fermi edge. You're trying to basically make localized states, so this impurity band tries to make localized states, but then it sees, if I increase my concentration, I have a sea of all these extended states here with, whin, with whom I can hybridize. And hence, what actually happens is I become more and more extended. And if you become more and more extended, if you see, this drops makes the exponent drop. The exponent goes down. So, what I think really happens in these systems is that it is the presence of the conduction band that dominates the localization physics in the single band impurity Anderson model at the top of the band. And that's something that all people sort of thus far ignored. It's a different model that you're really having. So there's for the non-experiments, there's there's a non-experts, there's a chase bound in the mid-80s which basically tells you uh, for the Anderson transition to be stable, the critical exponent has to be more than two over d. In 3D, more than two thirds. When I'm at one half here, I'm basically just below that value. So with the accuracy that I'm having, A, I don't really want to say I'm violating the bond, but on the other hand, the 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 Conditions for that particular bond are, of course, violated here. That bond was derived in basically figuring out what are the uh, most important divergent length scales that you have in your system. And here, because of the presence of the conduction band, I have an additional diverging length scales which dominates the whole system. So it shouldn't be a surprise that this thing actually goes in the region of the sort of the chase bound. It just tells us that in order to go to the chase bound, you have to have this additional diverging length scale in your system. So it's actually more confirmation that uh, that chase actually really works here. I think I must be way out of time, am I not? My chairman is... <laughs>